This is the day the Lord has made, so let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. And good morning. Welcome to our service of worship and praise in this first Sunday of the Advent season. Uh, a couple of changes in our service today. Uh, if you've looked at your bulletin, looked ahead, you'll see that there is some communion liturgy in there. This is not a communion Sunday. So after the sermon, uh, when we have the Apostles' Creed, I'll be directing you not to look in your bulletin, but to look up the screen for that. And then at the end of our service, uh, we'll have also the Wells Connection. There's going to be a reason for that, that it's at the end rather than the beginning. So we'll wait for that as well. But the beginning of our service, we'll start with the lighting of our Advent candles. And you can follow along. It's a responsive reading in your bulletin. We light one Advent candle, remembering Jesus who is coming again. He will come to gather his people from everywhere, both the living and the dead. We hear his call to watch. Come, Lord Jesus, be our guest. And we sing our first opening hymn, The Advent of Our King, verses 1 through 4. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Brothers and sisters in Christ, for centuries the faithful Old Testament believers waited longingly for the promise of a Savior to be fulfilled. Faith struggle is a reality in our lives, too. We wonder if God really will show up, if he will keep his promises to help and rescue us. In times of weakness, we find ourselves filled with doubts and misgivings. But God longs to heal us. So we bring our lack of faith, along with all our sins, and lay them at the foot of Jesus' cross. O oh Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your wrath. My guilt has overwhelmed me like a burden too heavy to bear. I am bowed down and brought very low. I groan in anguish of heart. I confess my iniquity. 
I am troubled by my sin. O Lord, do not forsake me. Be not far from me. Come quickly to help me, O Lord, my Savior. Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. In Jesus you have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace. We have been brought from death to life. Sin shall not be our master, because we are not under law, but under grace. We continue with the last verse of the Advent of our King. Comes to set us free with Father, Spirit, ever one through all eternity. Let us pray. Stir up your power, O Lord, and come. Protect us by your strength and save us from the threatening dangers of our sins. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading this morning for this first Sunday in Advent is from Isaiah chapter 63, beginning with verse 16, and then also chapter 64, verses 1 through 8. We echo the prophet's prayer here. Return, Lord. You, Lord, our, are our Father. Our Redeemer from of old is your name. Why, Lord, do you make us wander from your ways and harden our hearts so we do not revere you? Return for the sake of your servants, the tribes that are your inheritance. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains would tremble before you, as when fire sets twigs ablaze, and causes water to boil, come down to make your name known to your enemies. For when you did awesome things that we did not expect, you came down and the mountains trembled before you. Since ancient times no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. You come to the help of those who gladly do right, who remember your ways. But when we continued to sin against them, you were angry. How then can we be saved? All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like the wind our sins sweep us away. No one calls on your name or strives to lay hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have given us over to our sins. Yet you, Lord, are our Father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. And this is the word of our Lord. Blessed are they who hear God's word and live by it. Amen. Our second scripture read reading today is from Mark chapter 13. Jesus says, uh, keep watch and be prepared, for he is coming. Jesus says, but about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, be alert. You do not know when that time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge each with their assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. And this is the gospel of our Lord. We continue with the four verses of our next hymn, Jesus, Your Church with Longing Eyes. 
To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins with his own blood, to him be glory and honor forever and ever. Amen. The word of God for our meditation and blessing today from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, where Peter writes this. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of wrongdoing, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. And these are the words of our Lord. And in his name, the name of our Lord who will visit us someday. My brothers and sisters in Christ, typically uh, during this time of year from Thanksgiving to Christmas, there's all kinds of preparations going on at your house. And typically those preparations are made because you're expecting some visitors at the end of next month for Christmas. Maybe it's mom and dad, grandma, grandpa, uh, children, grandchildren, uncles, aunts, whoever. And you want to make that visit pretty special. And so you're doing these preparations. You're cleaning the house from top to bottom. You're getting the guests' rooms ready. You're making sure that the driveway is always shoveled and the sidewalks are always clean. Uh, maybe you're doing some meal prep as well. 
Like I said, typically that's the way it would work. This is anything but a typical year. So maybe those visitors aren't coming. Uh, and maybe we're going to just have to look forward to that time maybe next year when we can have more of a, a regular Christmas. Now, whether you're having any visitors come this Christmas season or not, here is the truth that I all want you to understand, that, that you are awaiting the arrival of a very significant visitor. During this time of year, during this Advent season, we are all preparing ourselves for the reappearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And on that last great day, when he does reappear, well, just as our theme says, it is God who is going to visit us on that great day. And how in the world do you ever prepare for a visit like that, God visiting you? Well, that's where our text for this morning helps. It encourages us to, first of all, in preparation for God visiting us, to function as prophet, priests, and kings. And then it also encourages us to abstain from evil, from sin, but then to live good lives. And that's what we want to talk about today. So at the time of our text, it's in the late 60s A.D., and the Apostle Peter is living in Rome at the time, and he's writing to Christians that are living far away in Asia Minor, which you've heard me tell you before is ancient or modern-day Turkey. And one of the first things that, that Peter feels it is necessary to remind these people of is this, all right? Verse 10, once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. And once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. See, these people to whom Peter is writing to, they were non-Jewish Gentiles. That means that in their lives, at one point, they were idol worshipers. And by their idol worshiping, they had placed themselves outside of the grace of God. But then, through the preaching and teaching work of men like the Apostle Paul, and later on by Peter himself, these non-Jewish Gentiles in Asia Minor, they, they got to know Jesus. They got to know that mercy of God. They got to know that they needed God's mercy because of their sins, and they got to know that God had shown them that mercy in their wonderful Savior, Jesus Christ. And obviously, we were all in that same situation. We were born into this world, the wicked children of parents who were wicked by nature. And if you ever start doubting that, then just ask yourself, well, then why do I keep on struggling with my sin every day? And if you're wondering about that, maybe it helps to think about it this way. Uh, just as those um, ancient Egyptian Gentiles worshipped their sun god, we modern-day American Gentiles sometimes do the same when our love for and our enjoyment of the great outdoors gets in the way of our worship of our God. And the way that those ancient Philistine Gentiles thousands of years ago, the way they worship their wheat God, we modern-day American Gentiles may be doing the same thing when we are always pursuing our daily bread and we are neglecting our God and his worship. Or just as those ancient Roman Gentiles, remember them from a couple of thousand years ago, how they worshiped their own emperor, we modern-day American Gentiles may be doing the same thing when we're always looking to our government to provide us only with what God can give to us in the end. Once we were not a people, once we had not received mercy. But then look at how Peter contrasts that. Here's the first verse of our text. 
But now you, you are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. You are God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Yes, you are a chosen people. God chose you. He picked you from eternity to belong to him. He chose you to one day worship a newborn Savior. He selected you to receive the gift of holiness by the way of, of the holiness of his own son for you. He picked you, of all people, and me too, to receive the benefits of Christ's death for the sins of the whole world. He chose you to raise with Christ on this world's last day. He chose you, he picked you, he selected you to be with him for all eternity. Wow, you're a chosen people. And you are a royal priesthood. That, that is what you are, of course, just, just as much as King David in the Old Testament was anointed to be a king, just as much as Jesus was specifically anointed on the day of his baptism to be a great king for us, you are kings. Or at the very least, you are all princes and princesses of your king, Jesus, by way of your anointing, your baptism. In fact, doesn't the Bible say that you are going to rule with Jesus forever and ever? And not only are you royalty, but you are also a priesthood. So, so just as much as Aaron from the Old Testament, the brother of Moses, and then all of Aaron's sons were anointed to be priests, just as much as Jesus himself was anointed to be your great, significant high priest, you are priests. You are all priests by way of your baptism, by way of your anointing. And that means that each and every one of you are a special assistant to Christ in his great work in this world. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. You are God's special possession. Why? That you may declare the praises of him, declare the praises of him, doesn't that mean you're also prophets too? So, so just as much as Isaiah was a prophet that was anointed to be a prophet, just as much as Jesus himself was anointed to be your great prophet, you are all prophets now by way of your baptism. With Bibles in hand, you are great ambassadors for Christ with a message of life. For this world. So, um, let's get this straight, okay? Once you and I were nothing. Once you and I lived in darkness. But then the light of Jesus dawned in our hearts, and we are God's people. And by way of our baptism, God has declared us to be prophets and priests and kings serving under our great prophet, priest, and king, Jesus. What an amazing turnaround in our life. How do we thank God for that? Well, um, you function as a prophet, priest, and king, right? For example, you are royalty. It says so right here. You are royalty. So function like royalty. And when we think of royalty these days, we think of the kings and queens of England that walk around with a crown on their heads and flowing robes, but they don't really do a whole lot. Contrast that with King David from the Bible. What did he do? He killed the Goliath, the giant, for his people. He slew tens of thousands of Philistines for his people. He defeated the enemy for his people. So, my fellow royalty, defeat the enemy. Yeah, yes, uh, slay Satan by bringing your children 
and your family members and your friends to holy baptism. Destroy the devil by bringing your relatives and your spouse and your co-workers to, to study God's word with you. Defeat the devil's power by preparing all those folks to receive the Lord's Supper with you, which the devil hates. Don't just sit on your royal throne. Rescue people. And you are not only royalty, but you are also priests. And it says so right here that you are a royal priesthood. And, and what typically did priests do in the Bible? Well, maybe more than anything else, you could say that they bridged the gap between God and people. Those Old Testament priests, they bridged that gap by the sacrifices they made, the blood of which always pointed to Jesus who brought us back to God. In the New Testament, they, they might bridge that gap by petitioning the Lord in prayer. So, my fellow priests... Bridge the gap between God and people. By all means, share with them the message of the great sacrifice of Jesus. But then pray, too. Every single morning, pray for the loved ones you have. Pray for the people you know who may not be trusting in Jesus right now. You can't pray them into believing. You can't pray them into heaven. But by your prayers, you are asking God to do what you cannot do. So function like a priest. And then, of course, function like a prophet, too. And, and what did prophets do? More than anything else, they just spoke the word of God. Sometimes those prophets would predict the future, which is something we cannot do. But most of all, they just spoke about the Savior, which is absolutely something we can do. And don't ever be thinking to yourselves, oh, I would never know what to say to people about Jesus. Of course you do. Assure them that there is a God. Maybe point to creation as proof of God's existence. Assure them that sin has caused this big barrier, this big wall between us and God. And, and point to the wickedness of this world as proof of sin existence. But then assure them that Jesus has torn down that wall between God and man. And he's done that with his perfect life and innocent death. Point to the Bible as proof of that. And then assure them that they can always come here to learn more. So, function as prophets. Yeah, Christ is uh, coming back. So function as a priest, function as a king, because in this way we are preparing ourselves for Christ's return. And is there any other way to prepare for his return? I suppose there is. And, and that's what the rest of God's word to us speaks about. It speaks about it first negatively and then positively. Here, here's the negative way. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. So if Christ is coming back, and he certainly is, if God is going to visit us, then abstain from sin. And here's the positive way of putting that. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on that day he visits us. So if Christ is coming back, and he certainly is, if God is going to visit us, then lead godly lives. And, and let's talk about both of those verses, the negative and the positive. Since Christ is coming back, since God is going to visit us, we need to abstain from sin. And let me just be clear by saying this to you, that Jesus has already forgiven you all of your sins. But when Jesus does return, we don't want to be found continuing in any great sin. 
And let's just suppose for a second that your great sin is lust, that your, your mind is occupied with sex outside of marriage, your eyes are occupied with sex outside of marriage, or God forbid, your bodies are occupied with sex outside of marriage. In view of Christ's coming, abstain from that sin. Maybe inform your spouse or a Christian friend of the struggles that you are having. And they can help you. And they can pray for you. And then get rid of your temptation. I mean, if, if the problem with all of this is the Internet in your life, then don't ever put yourself in a situation where you are using the Internet unmonitored. And if it's a, a, some other person in your life that's a big temptation, don't see that person anymore. Or if you are single and they are single, then maybe consider getting married to them. At any rate, in view of Christ's coming, abstain from sin. And then in view of Christ's coming, lead good lives. And, and not because you know that a good life is going to win you a spot in heaven. You already know that Jesus has won that spot and place in heaven for you by his perfect life and innocent death in your place. But when Jesus does come again, you want to be occupied doing his work. So go out, show love for your neighbor. Uh, if, if your spouse needs help in, in their work, then give it to him. If your spouse needs help watching the kids, then assist her. If your mom and dad need help uh, fixing up the place for visitors or putting up Christmas decorations, help them. If your children need help with their online assignments, with their homework, then give them the help that they need. If a classmate of yours is hurting, then help them. Pay them some attention. If a coworker of yours needs money, then give it to them. If an ailing relative of yours is failing, yeah, give them a call. If a neighbor of yours is lonely, try to make a, a visit with them. Because after all, Christ is coming. And as prophets and priests and kings for him, we want to be preparing for his arrival. Amen. And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Now I'm going to direct your attention away from your bulletins and up on the screens where we are going to confess our faith together with the words of the Apostles' Creed. We confess. Next screen. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And at this time, our offering will be brought forward. Let us pray. 
Come, dear Savior, we long for your appearing. Come to cheer us with your promises, as you once cheered your ancient people throughout their long night of waiting and watching. Come to restore our hope. Rouse us from the slumber of despair. Lift our hearts from petty, earthbound goals and direct our eyes above from where you will soon come to make all things right again. Come also to rekindle our joy as we prepare to celebrate your first coming. Do not permit a frenzied busyness to rob us of your peace or to deprive us of times to ponder and to wonder at your word. Set our hearts apart from the bustle and the clamor and the jostle of these days. Fill us with the quiet delight of finding you in the manger and keep hearts and minds undisturbed by the great throng that streams by uncaring. We also pray for those enduring great sorrow, for those undergoing spiritual trial, and for those whose restless hearts have no knowledge of your coming. Comfort, strengthen, and illumine them with the sweet peace born of your love and keep them in the way of peace by your holy word. Come quickly, dear Lord, and fill our longing eyes with the light of your coming. We wait, we keep watch, and in you we put our hope. And in your name we now join in praying the Lord's Prayer our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And we also pray. O oh Lord God, our Heavenly Father, pour out the Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us strong in your grace and truth. Protect and comfort us in all temptation. And bestow on us your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We close our service with the hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Good morning. If you're a guest today or visitor, special good morning. Welcome. Nice to have you with us. Uh, sign our guest book in our entryway before you leave, please. And do me the favor of introducing yourself to me before you leave, if you haven't done that already. Uh, we do have a number of announcements today. Uh, after our service, there will be Bible class, as we've been doing. Um, you can pick up your coffee 
over in the fellowship hall. Uh, we do need someone to put that coffee in the carafes for us, so I'm going to ask one of our members to do that, maybe uh, be the designated pourer too. Now pick up your um, uh, study sheets as well. Along with the study sheets, I believe I read off six copies of a paper that our own Pastor Smith delivered or gave or wrote uh, when he was a seminary student many years ago, uh, covering the exact topic from Revelation chapter 20 that we've been talking about. So uh, you could pick up a copy of one of those papers if you would like, and uh, if they're, we run out, we'll, we'll print some more. Also, then, um, I want to alert you to a, a several publications. We start um, the Advent season. If you haven't picked up one of these um, Advent devotion booklets on either of the counters, they were produced by our college professors at Martin Luther College, um, and they start today. If you want to pick one up, they're for you. Um, also from Martin Luther College, there are several magazines of their official magazine, In Focus. If you're interested in that, you can pick one of those up. Uh, the devotions start today, the new meditations, so pick one of those up. And I believe there are a couple of, of these copies of the My Devotions for Youngsters, for younger people, a couple of those left, so you can pick up one of those as well. Uh, also, uh, just a reminder, you saw that in the bulletin that the Women's Club is going to be, again, providing Christmas cards. You can see them uh, in the uh, fireside room if you'd want to purchase them and support the uh, Women's Club in that way. And then finally, uh, we have another pizza announcement. Uh, here it is. The holiday season is upon us and shopping has begun. You may have seen more sales than ever in the stores or online this year, but there is a scrumptious sale for you today in the narthex. Mount Olive is selling scrumptious Heggie's pizzas for $10 a piece to raise money to get swings added onto the playground. Uh, this sale won't be here for long, as today is the last day to order. So see Mr. Jensen in the narthex after these announcements to order today, and then the pizzas will be delivered to you December 10th. So if you're interested in helping out that day, uh, that way, be sure to do that. And that's at the end of our announcements. I'll ask our streamers.